this man in a pickup truck drove up, a farmer, and he just looked me over and looked the bike over and said, are you with NASA? In this final interview of 2023, I got the pleasure to talk with none other than the first ever digital nomad, Stephen K. Roberts, who 40 years ago, that's back in 1983, went 17,000 miles around US on a computerized recumbent bicycle. This story will not only travel you back in time, but will show you what it really means to turn your dreams into reality. Before the big adventure of computing across America, Steven was just a regular person like everyone else. I was working hard, but I was doing it to pay for something I didn't really want. Every single time I'd be in one of these conversations and some old man like me now would say, well, by God, you're right to do it when you're young. And you know what I would do? And they would tell me the stories of the dreams that never came true. I was doing things that people weren't used to seeing. Crowds would gather just to see the computer, not to mention the solar panels and the bike. It seems to me the trick for making your life seem longer is to do the thing that in retrospect has more memories, more details. But you are making choices every time you do something. Even if you don't make a change, you're making a choice, right? But the wanderer's danger is to find comfort. Hey Steve, welcome to the Nomad Solopreneur Show. Thank you. Good to be here. What a pleasure to have you. Can you walk us back to 1983 and share what inspired you to embark on your adventure across America on a recumbent bicycle? Well, I lived in Ohio in a city called Columbus, and I started realizing that I was doing things that were less and less fun. You know, all my hobbies and passions, freelance writing and consulting and all that stuff. I was working hard, but I was doing it to pay for something I didn't really want. I would bought a house in suburbia and lawnmower and just all these things like I'm playing grown up and that's so not me. And so more and more I was thinking, why am I working my tail off to pay for something I don't want? That's just stupid, right? So I was kind of thinking of different career choices and all this stuff. But what I all I really wanted was to find a way to take all the things that I most loved and put them all together and then do that for a living. So I started listing those things, you know, and their travel and adventure, and bicycles, computers, electronics in general, ham radio, falling in love, writing, meeting fascinating people. And I, I would just stare at this list and think, you know, what, it, what would really be perfect would be to travel full time while writing for a living. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So the trick was then to figure out how to actually do that. I didn't want to buy a big motorhome or caravan, you know, that kind of thing. I needed a way to do this on a human scale. So a couple of things had just happened. The very first laptop computer had come out. It was a little Radio Shack Model 100 made by Kyocera. About this big, small laptop. And it was 32K of memory and a 300 baud modem. But it was amazing. And freelance writers were discovering it, you know, and stuff. And also the computer networks were just starting to happen in the form of CompuServe, which was close to where I lived. So I was like, okay, we have a way to communicate. We have portable computers. And in the middle of all that, I met a guy who had a, one of the very first recumbent bicycles and click it. That was it. It's like recumbent bicycle, solar panels to run it all, portable computer networks. Now I can be anywhere and communicate with publishers and friends and base office and so on. That's how it started. It was really simple the way to solve a I guess it was weird because that wasn't a common thing to do, but it was a fantasy that drove me. So. A fantasy that saw you go 70,000 miles across the States. And I always wonder what people were saying when you saw yourself on the road on a computerized bike. What was the reactions? <laughs> I called myself an agent of future shock, which was a, a reference to a back then by a guy named Toffler. So the reactions were hilarious. There was one time in a small town in Ohio, I was sitting by a payphone with the computer and acoustic couple, you know, to connect to the handset. And this man in a pickup truck drove up, a farmer, and he just looked me over and looked the bike over and said, are you with NASA? I, I was doing things that people weren't used to seeing. I mean, crowds would gather just to see the computer, not to mention the solar panels and the bike. And so it was a combination of technologies that were all new. So every day it was opening doors. People would invite me home or call the local paper or whatever. Culturally, it was great because it, it opened doors and made the trip a lot easier. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that acceptance of the communities that you pass through to that curiosity to spark with as someone showing you all that technology on wheels passing is just unbelievable. And I noticed that you had on the bike solar panels. Nowadays, it's still not common. Just some high-tech camper vans probably have them, but it's still not a common thing. You're right about the solar panels that people would often understand that it was solar, but they didn't have a sense of the scale. So they were literally five watts, that about this big right there. And people would often ask if that ran the bike. And it's like, no, it's really tiny. But it would take a, a huge solar array to, to push the bicycle. But it felt like I was often kind of using tools that people didn't know about yet and showing what was possible. So a lot of the interviews and things were demonstrations of these devices and how people who are not trying to be nomads could use them in different ways. Newspaper re reporters love the idea of being able to travel and write and not have to sit at a desk. Yeah, and that's big because back then working from anywhere wasn't the case. And you, as a pioneer, making those first steps, showing what's possible, changed so many generations. And we end up in today's world where working from anywhere become the norm and it's getting so popular. I wrote a story called Work at Home, Work Anywhere. And the reference there is that there was a big discussion going on in the media at that time about whether you could work at home. That's what people were arguing about because everybody's used to going to offices. But because of things like CompuServe and other networks, suddenly it became possible to have a home office, convert a bedroom into an office. So there was all this discussion about whether or not that's possible and what happens with the lack of office culture and would people just lay around and be lazy. And this was a huge discussion. So then I come along and I start working on a bicycle and in a tent and in youth hostels and things like that. So it kind of took that to the next level. I mean, the networking was changing everything. I mean, I didn't invent any of that. I just put those things together we were seeing something marvelous happen that you're in Romania. And back then, just the idea of having a conversation with somebody in Romania would be ridiculous. We'd be spending like $5 a minute just to talk. Forget video, that, that wouldn't even be possible. So what was starting to happen, the, the barriers that we'd always had between each other because of our location were falling apart. If somebody was even in another state, I mean, I was in Ohio and if somebody was in California, there's no way I could do business with them or build a relationship or anything. So all of that stuff was changing really fast. Although weirdly, we were creating new barriers by building separate networks that didn't talk to each other yet. This is before the internet. That's getting a little esoteric, but I was on one called CompuServe. And if somebody was on Prodigy, they might as well have been in Romania, just a different culture almost. It was an amazing amount of change was happening then, and it made what I did possible. So. Yeah, that's amazing. And it was fascinating to take new and emerging technology and try to use it as best as possible, because most of people back then didn't do what you did. And that's interesting for me, because having this creativity to literally use technology to live your dream of working from anywhere, of doing what you love without limitations and such. But still, I assume there were a lot of roadblocks. There are a lot of things happening on the road. What was the craziest thing that happened to you? Oh, gosh. There's some that are long stories, but that's a hard one to answer just because every day was so different, you know, and I don't know the modern digital nomad culture, how much people depend on making connections and keeping a list of invitations and things like that. But I'm sort of stepping aside from that question because it's a hard one. But because I was publishing on the net, people would write me all these letters and say, hey, if you ever come through my town, look me up, right? So I had this database that got up to about almost 3,000 people uh, who had offered places to stay or connections. That's that's a lot. It's crazy. I could just connect the dots. And every day I'd say, okay, well, I'm here now. Who do I know here? You know, as you can imagine, every day was a completely different kind of experience. One night I'd stay with students in a dorm on a floor on a mattress. And then the next day I'd be in this beautiful mansion owned by some multimillionaire. And, and it was just this complete inversion day after day. That's the beauty of nomading. Even in today's life, we move between communities. We don't travel between places places. We literally search nomad communities and travel between them. But back then to literally move between local communities and experience new environment, like you mentioned, like from a multimillionaire uh, mansion to a dorm, 
It's just the experience, I assume, was so different. And all those connections, 3,000, it's huge in today's world because unfortunately, with the advance of technology, instead of being more connected, we disconnect ourselves and just connect through a phone or FaceTime. And we kind of push ourselves away from the pure human connection. I've wondered about the digital nomad communities, expatriate. Like in Mexico, there's there's always been communities of American sailors and people who've retired and so on. So they'll take a town and kind of turn it into a little American town, even though they're in another country. Do you see that sort of thing happening with the nomad community? In the expat world, yes, but nomads like traditional nomads that move quite often, at least months between place to place, in that situation, it's quite hard to make long-standing and meaningful relationships because they move to a place, they have like-minded people surrounded with, and it's much more easier to connect and stay longer. But if you move every three to six months to a new place, it's quite hard to have that bond. But still, since we move between communities, we kind of intersect ourselves with the same people. Sometimes, even by chance, we don't plan to, like we didn't talk about it or something, but we end up in the same place like before, which is nice. But unfortunately, it's much more hard. The chances are much more slimmer to meet up with the same people, to make long-lasting friendships and so on. That's why it's something that you cannot do long-term. As I know, you didn't do that either. You at some point moved to the water and I want to touch on that because it's fascinating to trade the road for the water. It was about a 10 year process. There were three stages of the bike. So the first trip was about a year and a half. And that the way I described it with the laptop and dialing up with the phone and so on. There was a point on there where I started wishing that I could write while riding. And it's really bothered me, in fact, that I would be out on the road all day pedaling and something would be writing itself in my head. And I think thinking about some chapter or some story. And then at the end of the day, I'm tired, I'm meeting people, I'm having dinner, whatever, you know, and I would never do it. So I decided that I wanted to build a new version that had a keyboard on the handlebars so I could write while riding. So the second one, which took about, gosh, nine months to build or something like that, it was like playing the flute. You know, I, I could play text while riding the bicycle. And another big change there, I met a woman named Maggie and asked her if she wanted to go with me. So I had a traveling companion for that next trip. So another year of traveling, both coasts of the United States. So by now we were up to 6,000 or 16,000 miles. And then I decided I wanted to do the really ultimate one. That's Behemoth, the one we polluted with the satellite communications and it was very heavy. And that was about three years of construction and then only about six months of actual travel because by then I was actually kind of sick of it when it was hard. It was this really big beast of a machine and I just kind of forgot that part. <laughs> you know, to answer your question, finally, somewhere in the middle of that, I was riding up the shore of Lake Michigan and I was just looking out over the water and thinking, man, you know, it's, it's time. This would be so nice if I just had all of this on a kayak or something and I could just pedal across the water and be no trucks and I wouldn't have to go up hills and oh, wow. And so that began the microship project. And there's way too many stages of that to talk about all of it. But over the course of a few years, I ended up building this little trimaran, the sort of canoe scale that was basically to have all the features of the bike, except more because technology was growing in something that went on the water. And the exciting news, by the way, I don't know how much you know about the microship from looking at my website, but there is now somebody who has taken it over and is going to take up where I left off. I'm really excited. He's going to go down the Missouri River and do the Great Loop around eastern United States. And he's going to do stuff similar to what I designed the boat for. So it's actually gone to somebody else. It was, it was hard. After all those years of building something to let it go, you know. But. Yeah, I imagine. But by looking at your environment now, I know that as well that you still live on a boat and you're basically a laboratory. Okay, this is no longer on the boat. I'm in a trailer now. I'm sitting in a 48-foot laboratory that is on wheels and I do old home movies and videos and slides and negatives and all those kinds of things. And I kind of do it as a little business while I'm working on writing projects and things like that. So it's a mobile laboratory. I can't get the mobile out of my life. You know, I just <laughs> had to be on with, I don't know if I, I don't know if it turns, I, this is a great big Mac. I can't really, it's hard to, we're looking down the length of a trailer there. It's hard to show you. There's a YouTube studio just just past where you can see 
and behind me is uh, audio and video switching stuff and a NAS and all those networky things. <laughs> so. What I love about it that you're still doing what you love. You never stop. Never stop. That's the bottom line. I got to tell you something that happened. This, this fascinated me. In the early days of traveling on the, the first bike, things were very simple. And I was going down the eastern coast of the United States, and I would stop in small towns and, you know, usually just looking for some place to have lunch or something. There was always a bench in a little town square or something, and always these old men sitting around, you know, these retired people just passing the time. It seemed to be a real common thing in these towns. So I started getting into the habit of just pulling up on my bike and striking up a conversation with them, partly to ask where to have lunch, you know, but they would always turn into a chat. Anyway, so every single time I'd be in one of these conversations and some old man like me now would say, well, by God, you're right to do it when you were young, when you know what I would do. And they would tell me the stories of the dreams that never came true. I heard so many old people tell me all the stuff that they wanted to do, but never did. And they would see me living my dream as a 30 year old on this crazy bicycle. And they would admit basically that they worked or they stayed at the office for 50 years or whatever, but they didn't follow their dreams. So to have all those people tell me that was really good because of course, at the beginning, I didn't have much money. My friends were telling me I was crazy. My parents hated it. I had to fight the little challenges and to keep hearing over and over from people that it was the right thing to do was encouraging. And now here I am 70. Yikes. I'm really glad I did that because, you know, if I hadn't, I certainly wouldn't be able to. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I can do this, but I'm not pedaling it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And it's something that I can relate. I'm also in my 30s and I, ha I hear the same things. Like when I go to a new location and meet locals that are in the same situation as those that you describe, they are going with their lives, not doing anything out of the normal, and they just live with that regret that, oh, I had that dream, but never came to life because I didn't do anything about it or something. And indeed, naysayers like family, friends back home, there will always be that will say, oh, you should have followed that path or you should be doing something else. But why? This is my dream. I'm living my dream. And yeah. Right. That's the most important. It's your life, right? That's your highest response. The highest responsibility is to yourself. And you have to build what makes you happy and keeps you growing and energized. And yeah. Have you found that you inspire people that you meet to, to look into the nomadic lifestyle? And has anybody followed in your footsteps? Yeah, funny enough, some friends did. And I'm actually very good at inspiring others to choose locations. I have a funny story in which two of my friends had a kid on an island, let's say thanks to me, because they arrived there during the pandemic and they weren't able to leave and my friend had to give birth. And now that person was born on an island. More things like this that make you think just by having conversation with someone, you can change their path and it became their favorite place. It's so interesting that this lifestyle can be a dream for many. But in the same time, not for everyone, because I have also a lot of people that, thanks to me, started the lifestyle, but they didn't enjoy it because they assumed that it's a constant travel. It's a constant adventure. Every single time you step out of your comfort zone, something will happen. Like you'll encounter unexpected situation and life will happen. But in the same time, it's not a constant adventure. Every day is something exciting because I'm literally changing location, living in different location but not like you, like all the time on the road, moving every single day. And I think that's the big difference to not have all those constant adventures, but which is kind of pity, but in the same time is tiring. So do you find that clients are more accepting of that now? Because when I was doing it back then, I, I had some consulting clients, big corporations, and I was doing engineering writing and things. And there was one that I just never told. I thought, I know these people and they're not going to understand the idea of me sitting in a tent somewhere writing their industrial control system engineering documentation. They're just not going to get that at all. And so <laughs> I wonder how much that's changed now because people are way more used to the idea of working via the internet and the information space that we live in. That's probably a huge difference. Yeah, but at the beginning, for example, it was a struggle even by the fact that I was working for Romania. So I was having clients in the United States and when they heard that I'm not in the United States, 
they're quite reluctant to work with me. There was some sort of uh, barrier, but slowly people understood that you can literally hire freelancer and contractors from anywhere and you can work with anyone. And after that, when I started my nomad lifestyle, my old client I already worked with, they were like, really excited some of them they were concerned especially when i went to asia and we were like 12 hours apart and it's like how gonna communicate and i was always for asynchronous communication through short screen recordings or emails or slack or other tools otherwise it's quite hard and i I see people that had a remote job and need to be in meetings and during the office hours to be online and it's quite a struggle especially if you're half of the globe around the world and that's the thing but apart from that my clients call go like this like 10 minutes we talk about adventure we talk about what happened in the last couple of weeks or months since we spoke and all those things make a stronger bond and they're excited for me even some of them they tried as well to travel for a few weeks at a time to see how it goes how the business evolves so yeah it's getting quite popular and a lot of jobs before weren't possible to do remote now they find solution to do so for example lawyers even some doctors that don't need to like physically touch people they do remote and it's an interesting period that we're going through and i know that after the pandemic a lot of big corporations start to convince people to get back to office some of them they are still struggling because people got used to having that flexibility i have a friend who's director level in a big company here and he's been traveling for a year or more now full-time on his boat and just having adventures and always at anchor somewhere. And he's got all these parallel communication tools, you know, Starlink and things like that, but all these multiple cellular pipes. He can like do Zoom meetings and things while other stuff, all from some little tiny place way up in Canada or something. It's marvelous because back when I was doing this in the 80s, travel was seriously disruptive. The traveling salesman was almost a cliche because it was people who could live out of a suitcase and always be sending things by mail and Federal Express back to a secretary somewhere and stuff. So to be productive while traveling, especially with only text, because the communication back then was 300 baud text only, no pictures, no video, no audio. Phone calls were expensive. I spent about $300 a month Uh, just on phone calls. And going online, you had to dial up access code locally, which would be like a node, like Telnet or TimeNet or something, and then connect from that to the service you use, like in my case, CompuServe. So if you're in a place where there was no local dial-up, then there was also long distance just to go online. So it was complicated. Yeah, lots of pieces had to be put together. (laughs) Definitely. And I think that was the biggest struggle back then, not having uh, this mainstream communication that you have now. As you mentioned, if you have a Starlink, you can connect almost from anywhere. And that's something back then was missing. And in terms of client communication and finding projects, since you're constantly on the move, you have like stable client base that you work with. Back when I was traveling, I was mostly freelance writing for magazines and I got a book contract. So I was writing that just on my own, but I also did what I called consulting writing. I would describe it as translating what engineers did into something that was readable by normal humans uh, because engineers couldn't write for the most part. And they would put this stuff out that was completely bewildering to people. I was the intermediary, right? So a lot of that I could do on the phone but mostly that took really getting to know a company and their product line. So that was hard to do while traveling. But magazine writing, easy. In fact, it was sort of self-referential, self-supporting, because I used to call it journalist as news, because the story often was how I was able to do the story. You know, I had a column in USA Today magazine where I wrote about how people were using personal computers, but a lot of my stories were just about what I was doing and the tools I was using and new tools that were coming along and all that stuff. So it it took on a life of its own and became just self-supporting. I described it as a three-way symbiosis of the project itself and sponsors and media. And because companies started giving me stuff at some point when I started getting all this publicity, and that would provide me with new things to build that I got excited about, which gave me more things to write about, which led to more sponsorship. But at the beginning, it was fun. I mean, that's how Behemoth happened, that final version of the bike, the really big one. Part of the problem there was that Instead of looking at it as 
okay, what do I need to solve this problem? Like the original bike, you know, I have this specification, this thing I want to do, how do I solve it, right? Well, by the time I was doing Behemoth, the huge one, it was like, ooh, this is really cool. How can I put this on the bike? And that's an inversion, right? And what it meant was I added more than I really needed to address the basic requirement of being able to travel and write and things like that. It was actually really fun because building that last one was this technological tour de force, but the construction was the best part. And then the others, the travel was the best part. Yeah. yeah that's the thing. Like sometimes a journey can be on a road and other that it can be building something. And I know that you mentioned that was over $1 million, uh, the cost of the last one. Yeah, the equivalent, I mean, that was not out of pocket. It's like, I didn't have a million dollars to spend, but it was the equivalent value if you included all the sponsorship and the time and volunteers. I believe the number is 45 volunteers, people mostly in Silicon Valley who would come around and just work on it with me. And Sun Microsystems gave me lab space for over a year. So I had this wonderful corporate host and all these really smart people who would take on projects. So I got this gorgeous custom engineering cross point, audio cross point switches and you know the pneumatic landing gear and all this stuff it was like a mini nasa i had all these smart people working on it with me and if you added all that up that was about 1.2 million in guesswork value but i never paid anything like that so yeah i wanted to ask that if you paid it and it was quite a lucrative writing uh job you had yeah, unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> that to the microship boat project because that's what i do i build crazy machines and then i carry them around and write about them that was my job well, that's a beautiful thing because as long as you continue to build something to be passionate about a life worth living often we end up in the situation that you described those local people just sitting doing nothing seeing their life go in front of their eyes and you end up on a place of regret and speaking of that i want to ask you do you have any regrets in your journey? Oh, yeah, quite a few. I mean, I guess everybody has like, you know, selling a piece of land that I used to own, you know, that was dumb. Uh, you know, the, the joke of the one who got away, you know, people I was in relationships with that I, I didn't fully recognize how important they were. And then I let them sort of fade. And then in retrospect, I was like, oh, man, you know, how did I let that in? That kind of thing. I guess we all do that. It has nothing to do with the travel. But yes, I have regrets like everybody else. Probably as far as the, the machines go, letting the boat get too complicated. I didn't really tell you about this. When I started the boat project, it started as a kayak and it's like the bike, simple human power, small. And then I was out on the water one day and the weather went terrible, just got so cold. And I had this beautiful sponsored you know, dry suit, uh, not dry suit, but outdoor weather thing that was in a, a hatch in the kayak. And I realized I can't get that. I mean, here is this is in a hatch on a little tiny boat that I'm sitting on. And the only way to get that out of there would be to capsize the boat swim forward, take the thing out, <laughs> get back in, pump out, put the coat on, and then I'd be freezing. So obviously that's ridiculous. So I realized that what I really needed was either a catamaran or a trimaran. So that was the next step. Okay, I will make a kayak scale trimaran. And then that kept growing. And then pretty soon it was up to a real sailboat. And then I kind of recoiled from that and, and did a small one. Anyway, I went through all these stages where and each one of them cost a lot of time. I was building all this electronics while changing boats. And meanwhile, the electronics was getting obsolete because it was taking time to do the boat projects. So I just took too long. I should have just gotten on with it, with a kayak or anything, and just gone and had myself an adventure because uh, I didn't get much time on the water. And then later, I actually got a big sailboat. But that's why I want to test that you end up spending quite a lot of time on the water or after you build, you just move to the next boat or how do you go about it? I kept on changing the substrate to get it right. So I had some little adventures, like two or three weeks adventure on the water, those kinds of things. And then I actually bought an actual sailboat at one point, a 44 foot sailboat. And I did cruise that for many months. It was wonderful. And then I was living at the dock and then I changed to my current boat, which is a 50 foot power boat. I don't know what I was thinking. I haven't been off the dock in this thing, you know, and now I'm just trying to sell it 
Well, it's beautiful. It's the one where you've, you've seen the pictures that look like that. Um, you know, I built a really cool lab in it and a machine shop down near the engine room and everything. It's, it's beautiful. But too much time passed again because I was spending all my time building the lab stuff and writing and starting a business and all this other stuff. So I didn't really cruise this big boat. So it's time to get rid of it. Want a boat? I wish I can afford it. <laughs> I always admire people with boats because in a way it's the ultimate ultimate freedom because you can literally go and sail and stop wherever. Of course, if weather allows it and if it's a place to dock, but it feels such a cool thing to do because literally like you and the water. Yeah. And the sailboat was the sailboat that I had for a few years, very much so. You know, it's, there's something just magical about going somewhere and then dropping the anchor. And now you're your own little island and you have power with solar panels and a water maker so you can have fresh water and you can fish or you have your stores and you can cook. And it's like you're just this own little world and it's free. Nobody charges you to be at anchor, you know, or go anywhere. So it's, you're right. The, the perfect nomadic tool, I think, is a small sailboat in the 30 to 40 foot range, big enough to be comfortable in. But I didn't have any personal desire to go around the world, but the boat that I had would have been capable of it. There's all these philosophies of travel that fall out of all this. And one of the ones that hit me early on when I was on my bike and just reminded me just then, if you think too much about where you're going, you lose respect for where you are. You know, you can be in this beautiful place. And if you're just trying to get across the United States because you need to be in California to finish the trip, then you're just not noticing here. Right. So I've always tried to remember that it's so easy to forget and doing things like crossing oceans has an element of that because nobody wants to just sit in the middle of an ocean for a long time. If you're crossing an ocean, you kind of want to get to shore eventually. <laughs> and so it, I've always been more of a coastal cruiser and just kind of, it's called gunk holding, just poking around and dropping the anchor wherever and exploring and meeting people and stuff. And that I love. I, I'd like to do more of that. Yeah, that's beautiful. And what I love about it now, the technology, how fast at the pace that it's advancing. I noticed some really cool solar powered, I think they are catamarans, if I'm not wrong. It's amazing. Like you don't need a sail anymore. You just, of course, you need sun, but in the same time, a solar panel works a bit, even if it's cloudy. I would combine solar and sail because then when one's not there, you still have the other. That's a nice combination. They, they go well together, except for shading. Catamaran or a trimaran a sailboat with solar panels between the hulls. That's a really nice combination because you can have enough power to actually move you. Not like just a little charger for your electronics, but actual propulsion. Oh, now you're making me want to get back on the water. Maybe that was the goal of this podcast episode. <laughs> we get this power boat sold and get a small sailboat and get on with it <laughs> while I still can. <laughs> Uh, but what made you move from the water to the shore again? Oh, I know what it was. This is really silly. I was uh, living aboard the boat and for a long time, and I had this little digitizing business. It's really a sweet business. It's emotional. It's a time machine. This is a time machine. And I'm doing all these things for people's own personal histories and stuff. And it's a service business, and it doesn't really scale well, and I should have an employee. And there's things wrong with it. It's, it's so much fun to just have these tools that I was putting them all together on the boat. So on the boat, I built a laboratory with movie digitizing and video digitizing and things like that. And the problem was it was just too much to fit onto a boat. It was a very practical problem. And people would come over to pick up their project and oh, there's my cat and my dirty dishes and all my junk and client jobs on the floor. And it was just too tight. And so I thought, okay, I'll stick the little business up in town. I'll rent a little place and I'll keep living on the boat and walk to the business. And it just kept on moving in that direction. And then I stopped really thinking about getting off the dock on a big power boat. So I guess it's kind of like everybody else's life. We make these things that feel like little adaptations and small decisions just because of stuff that's happening. A lot of relationship changes or you lose a job or whatever, and you just adapt and you move through life and, oh, you get a new apartment. And then you realize that you actually were making really big decisions and your entire life has changed because of these things, but you didn't realize it while it was happening. You are making choices every time you do something. Even if you don't make a change, you're making a choice, right? And it's funny. I used to joke that I would probably only recognize the journey's end in retrospect. 
And like looking back, like, well, I haven't pedaled my bike in three years. I guess it's over. It kind of feels like that. It's not like you t- choose a moment to go, okay, well, that's it. Throw the switch. I'm done. That's never what it felt like to, to make changes. So, Yeah, that's the thing. Because sometimes, for example, thinking like, how long I'm going to be able to do this, like physically or even to have the willingness to do so. And I'm pretty sure it happened as you described. Like I will just probably stay instead of six months in one place, one year, two years, and I will just realize, oh, I have a move in two years from this place. Probably I settled. It could be because of a relationship or because of comfort. You know, Paul Thoreau once wrote that the wanderer's danger is to find comfort. A nice line. It's suddenly not as interesting. You know, you're in love with somebody or you've got this beautiful place and or you've got a great client or do you have a home that you could go back to at some point or are you kind of collecting them as you travel and thinking about possible spots where you would? Yes, that's what I do now. I literally have a list with the favorite places I see myself as settled down. And luckily enough, I, I travel with my partner and we kind of have the same list. So we are on the same page on that. So that's good. But in the same time, uh, we both say that it will be hard to settle down like forever. Once you got this bug and it, it's so beautiful to arrive in a new location and start learning about the local communities, see how different is the world, how beautiful it is. And all these t- new things, it's like searching for dopamine. It's literally like that because you, you find new things, you enjoy new things. It's so hard to imagine yourself that, oh my God, gonna stay here like forever. Probably even when we'll settle down, we'll travel for half a year maybe, or maybe three months only, but we'll still have those exploring activities because otherwise it's just not living anymore once you got used to this lifestyle. There's a a kind of a subjective life extension and I've noticed that the periods of time when I was traveling, while they were happening, the time just flies by. It just feels like I'm just living like crazy. And then I look back over it and it feels really, really long. Like when I look back over my bicycle trip, it feels like my whole life. And I remember all these different places and people and stuff. And the times when I've been stopped somewhere, like, well, Columbus, that's where I started. I was there for four years. And while I was there, the time seemed to drag. And when I look back at it, it's like that. It's just like, ah, what did I do? What did I do for four years? I can't even remember it, you know? And so it seems to me the trick for making your life seem longer is to do the thing that in retrospect has more memories, more details, more more waypoints, you know, like uh, to use a sailing metaphor. And so I've always felt that the times when I've been traveling and, and building and moving and things like that, I'm getting more life out of it. And I see myself doing that now. I'm in one place doing the same thing. And yeah, okay, I've been here for a year just doing this. Yikes, I'm doing it again, you know? <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that all the equipment that you have now in the lab to work with in a caravan or? Yeah, it's not a caravan. It's a cargo trailer. It's actually a race car hauler. So it's a very shiny oh. trailer made for people to move their fancy race cars to tracks. So it's very shiny and beautiful. And it's got a bathroom and a, a gooseneck up in the front where you can have a mattress and things. But it's huge. It's 48 feet long. So. But it'll still be possible to move with it, right? Yes. You still have a chance to hit the road again. <laughs> I have kept that in mind. And while building it, I've been planning on it. I'm planning on it being mobile or at least portable. There's a lot of things that aren't tied down yet. Right now, if I were to try to do that, I would have to hire people with pillows and rolls of duct tape and, you know, (laughs) to run around in here and try to keep things from falling over. But that can all be fixed. You know, there's this thing behind us here. It's a 10 feet long and it's on wheels that lock in position. And so to get behind it for all the cabling, I can pull it out and walk back there and move things and install things. And I push it back. And then against the wall, there's this stuff called E-Track that it locks into. So I'm working on it, but it would take a few months to get ready to roll. But it could. It has a hitch and I have a truck. So yeah, I have actually had the fantasy of being able to take the lab to some nice place that I just love somewhere and stay for a few months and kind of do all the local media and people could bring over their old movies and things and hire somebody. Well, anyway, it's a long fantasy. <laughs> so. And what's amazing about that is the fact that you literally bring lost memories to life. For example, I have a crazy story that I cannot prove, 
I used to raise two wolves when I was a kid. I, I'm from the Transylvania region of Romania. And I, I have somewhere a digitized film picture that went with one of the wolves because only one of them were able to get close to it. We found them as puppies and we, we grew in with my brother. But I cannot find it. And even if I found it, I'll probably not be able to... It's a movie, a home movie? Uh, yes, the old picture style movie. Yeah, send it to me. I'll do it. And then I can send you the file through Dropbox or whatever. So, Yeah, that would be awesome because I shared this story in my travels and people say like, I want to see a picture of that wolf. And I was like, I don't have it. I need to find it. I need to find that film. That is a genuine offer. I'll do it for you. No charge. And, and when you said Transylvania, I almost asked you earlier if you were from that region. I just finished a job for a client here about, I don't know if, 1500 slides. She spent years and I've been kind of immersed in Transylvanian culture and she's become a friend because she's a client here in the island. So knowing that, I would love to do your movies. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully I can find it. That, that's the beauty of Transylvania. Some parts of the region are like traveling back in time. We have fortified churches, very old villages and people still living like they used to live hundreds of years ago. It, it's unbelievable. Every time when I travel to those remote places, it's like literally traveling back in time. And it, it's an underrated region. I mean, usually people think about Transylvania, they think about Dracula and vampires and stuff. And they go to those touristic places. But if you get off beaten path, you can encounter wildlife like wolves, bears and everything. Oh, that's fun. That's really interesting. I hope you find it. Thank you. It was a nice period. And yeah, living near the forest and living near to all this wildlife was different because now in my travels, I encounter different type of remote regions, but they are less and less frequent because of human expansion and exploration of wilderness. And it's so rare, of course, if you don't go to places like Africa, where I haven't been just to Egypt, but yeah one day <laughs> that's fascinating some of these images well wow, i mean we've been going on but it, it's one of the best parts of this business that i do is i get to vicariously live other people's lifestyles you know it's, sometimes it's just seeing worlds that i didn't know existed or just other realities but sometimes it's seeing what happens with the person the client and how it affects them emotionally i've had many people in tears just because I've just opened up this huge history of their lives and seeing their parents as little children and things like that. It's, it's marvelous. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love you to tell those watching or listening how they can get in touch with you in order to work with you, because this is one of the most beautiful jobs I ever heard of. You can bring back so many memories and a lot of people have those old films and most families have the box of old movies or videos or slides or whatever. So probably the easiest way is to go to microship.com, my website, and there's a contact form on there. And that's probably easiest to remember because that'll be my website address anyway. And there's a page for the business there, but I haven't really done a lot of marketing. I'm busy, but the contact form does work and reaches me as email. So. Perfect. And for those listening, I'll put the link in the show notes as well. So we have a tradition in the show to end up with a challenge for those listening. And the challenge will be addressed by you. And it's a short one. They should be able to complete in less than 24 hours. And in your case, I would like to challenge those listening to do a first step in order to start living their life. I like it. And that's a really good idea. Identifying your passions is such an important part because so many people make decisions based on what's a good business, will this make money, what do people expect of me, what do my parents think that I should do, and none of that matters. What matters is what gets you excited. What do you lie awake at night and just fantasize about? And those are the things that are important. Right. And it, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be a business or anything. But what, what is it that that just gets you excited and makes you want to do more of it and makes, you know, makes your dreams light up? So identifying those things, I think for most people, f figuring out what those are is the key to finding the thing that will then make you happy if you can incorporate those passions into whatever you do. That's beautiful. And it, it's all linked from your own example. Like you literally put on a paper all the things that you enjoy doing, all the things that you love, and eventually build that bicycle and you hit the road. So you're the perfect example and you give the perfect challenge. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. 
It was wonderful, Steve. I'm even a bit emotional because I wasn't expecting you know, to have on the show the first digital nomad, the first person that pioneered all these things. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with me tonight. Well, thank you. It's a really, really interesting conversation. Thanks for listening, everyone. While this is the last interview from this year, this is not the last episode because next week, a special episode in which I'll put together the best parts of the first 50 episodes of the show. Some big, big moments will come your way. And don't forget to subscribe and follow. Thank you so much. Until next week, Pura Vida!